great to see you all again. So you can see that I'm not in England at the moment. I'm in the Alps, pretty obvious really. And I am gonna answer your questions that I asked about in last week's video. Well, as you can probably see from my surroundings and all this snow, that's cold. I'm in the Alps and I'm gonna do a q and A. I'm gonna try and do, answer some of the questions in various different locations, make it a little bit of fun and hopefully take some shots along the way as well. So in my last video, I asked for some questions that I could answer. And so there was a, there was a, a theme of questions that came up. They tend to be about how I earn money composition, equipment and camera stuff, and light and exposure and focus. So I'll try and sort of um, answer them in those sort of general themes. The first question that I want to answer is how I make money with photography. So before I get onto the details of it, and I'm gonna do a full video about this, I, I wanted to say that first of all, it's difficult to make money from photography. You need to have an audience and a um, people that are interested in the things that you are going to sell. So that's the first thing that I wanted to get right. Um, having set up a business before, I knew how important it was to have something that people were really interested in. And then once I had that, then I could then start to um, develop products that I could sell to those people. But I don't want to sell to them and just take their money. I want them to be able to buy things from me that they will get real value from and then I can hopefully have repeat customers as well. So the first of those, the first of the set of pie things that, um, uh, the, the, the first piece of the pie really that allows me to make money is workshops. So you've probably seen that I've done workshops, most of them have sold out for this year and I do a different variety of workshops. I do one-to-one -one workshops, group workshops and then residential workshops and they are probably around about a fifth to a quarter of my revenue. The other part of it is ad revenue. So that is ad revenue from things like YouTube and my affiliate links like Amazon affiliates. So the third part is print sales. Now this might be print sales from through box sets which are really successful or individual print sales. And a lot of people asked about what types of prints sell well. Um, and it's, it's really difficult to say that because in, I, I sell a lot of my prints to the US and a, a lot of my um, prints of the time I spent in the US do really, really well. Um, and then the other prints that do well are something that's just a little bit different. So the Bleetar one with the rainbow, you know, is really successful for me. But I don't get, I probably get a little bit more revenue from my workshops than I do from my print sales. My ad revenue as well, I should mention, my YouTube ad revenue. I'm now on around about 200,000 views a month and I get roughly around about 500 pounds a month. Um, but I didn't start getting ad revenue until about a month and a half ago where I started to um, monetize my videos. And I don't monetize them as soon as I put them on, so I could probably up that slightly, but not much. But obviously, it's hard to get ad revenue. You know, to get 200,000 views a month on your videos is difficult. So don't expect to make a huge amount of money from that. But, it, you know, that 500 pound a month just adds as part of that pie. The other thing is commissions. So that might be somebody asking me to do stills or videos for them, and that helps me to, ge to generate more revenue. And that total revenue now, I'm just at the point where I can, I, I feel like I'm making a reasonable living. And those four cornerstones of my revenue are things that I concentrate on all the time. I'm gonna talk about it in one single video as well so you'll find out more about it. Okay, let's go to the next location. One of the other questions that I've been asked as well is about whether I'm still using my Nikon. Obviously I did the, the video that you can see here about moving from Nikon to Fuji and whether that was a good idea and whether I, I'm going to dump my Nikon camera. Well, I'm not. I've decided I'm going to keep my Nikon and my Fuji. And this, this um, trip is a really good example of that. I've kept my Fuji X-T2 in my bag all the time and it's really light and easy to carry and it makes it so easy to get out and about and it's much lighter so I can get those images that I might not have done if I'd have had my Nikon D810 because I'm... that's really wobbly. 
because if I had my Nikon D810, it would have been really, really difficult to carry with the lenses. Okay, just about to get off, so see you soon. Okay, so I've just stopped by the side of the slope here, and one of the great things about skiing is that you can get over a lot of the mountain. But what I've seen here is, and I just wanted to talk about this image because it's a really good example of a good black and white image on a really sunny, bright day, and how you can use black and white to create some amazing shots. So you can just see the ridge of snow that's created that leads up to the mountain at the top there. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to use some of the patterns on the right hand side of the snow to anchor the right hand side and then this ridge will lead your eye up all the way through to these rocks. Now what makes the image really special is that it's not just blue sky but I've got some cloud as well and the cloud looks fantastic in black and white. So if I effectively put a red filter in in Lightroom afterwards then obviously that makes the sky black and then I get that really dramatic look looks absolutely amazing okay I'm gonna take this and continue just oh one more thing I'm taking it on my Fuji X-T2 35 millimeter prime lens and just setting it at f8 handheld it's the great thing about shooting at this time of day when it's so bright you've got all this white snow as you can handhold it and you know it's probably about two thousandth of a second so it's really easy to just take this really light camera with this small lens and take some fantastic shots First question from Piece of Cake is Hey Nigel, I'm studying at college. How do I make it in the creative visuals field? I'm very much interested in starting a YouTube channel and travelling to destinations for my career. What are your suggestions? So that's a really good question. What you've got to do is just get your content onto YouTube. So it's really important to just get content out there and start a YouTube channel and start to get a little bit of a following. And certainly in the creative industry where you're doing photography or videography, it's fairly easy to do that with some quite cheap equipment. You know, you can even do it with your phone and do get amazing results. So I suggest just getting out there on YouTube and publish some content. Next question, my masterpiece of Iverson is, Hi Nigel, I'd love to know how you promote your videos. Looking forward to see you in Iceland. Smiley face. Yeah, I'm looking forward to Iceland too, I can't wait. Um, yeah, so promoting YouTube videos is something that I did quite heavily at the beginning. Um, you know, I, I really try, tried to promote them on forums and um, you know, I wrote to a few online magazines and see if they'd feature some of my content. I was fairly successful with that, but ultimately what it came down to and what I realised is you've just got to have really good quality content. And if you have good quality content, then you get more suggested videos on YouTube and that's just then much more successful. So there's no magic solution to promoting your videos. You've just got to produce great content, just like you do, Mass. I, I, you know, you, your, your content's fantastic and I love it so much. Another question is, hi Nigel, I as a retired guy doing a college course, can you advise me the best ways to go about selling my work as prints, please? Yeah, so that's, that's a really good question. Um, I think to sell your prints you've got to do one of three things really you've got to either have prints that um, are, 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 are unique of, of a location so really stunning and special images that you know people want to buy because it's just one of a kind you've got to have a series of images that works well so if you have like a series of autumnal images that are also special then people do like to buy images in in pairs or in, in three so that works really well. And then the, the other thing that, that, that works really well is, is having an image that is, means something to, to, to somebody. So when I lived in California, I took an image of the Golden Gate Bridge from a place called Tiburon, and it was fairly unique angle, and it meant somebody to the people living around there um, that had the same sort of view of the bridge. So that was successful. When I came back to the UK, I sold, I sold that image. Next question, my, my Mr. Frequent is, what efforts do you take to minimize dirt or contamination so that's, yeah, so that's a really good question. I don't think you need to really worry too much about it. It's more important to get the shot. But obviously you don't want to be changing lenses when it's windy on a beach. <laughs> um, so yeah, protect it a little bit, just cover it up a little bit and try and do it as quickly as you can. But most important is getting the shot. So not spending 10 minutes changing your lens and setting up everything to change your lens and then the light's changed. So yeah, just be quick. Also, what music do you use? 
Yeah, so the music um, I use is a question that gets asked so much in my um, comments below and I always forget to put it in the description. So I get my music from Epidemic Sound, there's a link in the description below and certainly if, you, if you're starting a YouTube channel I definitely recommend that you subscribe to them and if you use my link below then um, I get a percentage of that and that goes to, you know, it's massively helps me run this YouTube channel so I really appreciate that. And I find all my YouTube music on Epidemic Sound um, and the music I use a lot is from a, a band called Windshield and the song I use a lot is Sober by Windshield. Tony asked, is it better to use Lightroom or Photoshop or both and why? I would recommend you use Lightroom 99% of the time because it's easier to use. The other 1% use Photoshop because you only need to use it for photo stacking. Bye now, chugga chugga choo choo. Psh. Next question by Mike Jenkinson is, do you ever look at the weather and think, well, there's no point in going out today, or do you always go out and hope for the best? <laughs> yeah, so I, um, it's a bit of both really. I, I quite often look at the weather and think, oh, I'm just not gonna go out. So, so sometimes, depending on whether I've got other things to do, I'm, I might not go out because the weather's not great. But if I do go out, I never regret it, and I always get something that's really useful from the trip. So whether that's just a scouting trip, or sometimes the weather changes, and I get some amazing light with some dark, clouds and and um, it's useful going out and quite often I, I'm sat at home thinking oh, I wish I had gone out and suddenly you get that golden light on on the trees and the dark clouds behind and you think oh, I wish I'd gone out okay thanks a lot let's get skiing so Kim Grant asks what has been your YouTube highlight so far I have to say that my video that I did which is when I started doing weekly videos in Buttermere was probably one of my highlights. When I climbed um, haystacks with my son and videoed, did that video, it was a stunning evening. And we just watched the sunset, it was still and beautiful. So that's probably my highlight. And I also talked for the first time about my accident I had in Yosemite, which was a big, big thing for me. So yeah, that, that was definitely my highlight, but I just love being out and being in places like this, which is just absolutely amazing. It really doesn't get much better than this. Okay, I'm now at the top of um, Salia, which is one of the biggest um, mountains in th this area. And it's absolutely fantastic. You can see these gorgeous peaks in the background of the Alps, it just make stunning black and white compositions. I've just take taken a shot of this here, just with my X-T2, which is what I'm recording this video on. 35 millimeters and I'll show you that image in a minute. But before I do that, I just want to answer some questions around compositions. So I've got a question here from Max and he's asked if there's always a fine line between going back for the light or finding a composition and being in that location at that time and maybe you're walking your dog or something and you think, well, I, can't, I don't have time to wait. Um, so I'm gonna take the picture anyway, even though the light's not perfect. And what do I do? Well, well, what, what I do is I, if I'm walking my dog and I find good compositions, I take those shots, but I don't think they're gonna be the best shots that I ever take. So I note down those locations and I make sure I go back to them when it's the best conditions. If you're really gonna get the best shot possible of that location, then it's a really good idea to go back to it when the conditions are best, whether that's the best, whether it's foggy, whether it's sunset or sunrise. Now I realize that that's not always the case. So if it isn't the case and you're on holiday somewhere, then maybe you can just get back once or twice and see if you can get better conditions and, and or just make the most of it. But my best shots have been when I've gone back knowing that I've got a good composition and I take that shot. Okay, I've got another shot here which is um, around taking a shot and, um, and light. So a lot of people wanted to know how I exposed my shots, but also um, a, a little bit more about the exposure to the right of the histogram and is that important? But, well, it is important, really. You, you need to expose to the right of the histogram as much as possible. So it's better to do that, to expose for the highlights and push that as much as you can to the right-hand side because you'll get a much better quality shot. So another question that was mentioned was Chris, and he said, Hi, Nigel. Great to see Pebbles having fun. Question for me would be about balancing a high-contrast exposure. For example, I took some shots of a waterfall recently but with the sun shining almost directly on the falling water and found it difficult to expose for the light. 
Well, if you think about it, waterfall is and light exposed um, sh shining off that sort of glassy surface of water is going to be very difficult to expose for. So it's better if you're exposing for a waterfall just not to go there when the sun's shining on, the, on, on that waterfall because it's going to be extremely difficult with that high dynamic range scene to take it. So you better to go back when it's raining and all the foliage is wet but you've not got direct light on, on, on the um, waterfall and then you're balancing the exposure between the waterfall and the shadow areas of the rocks or the foliage around it. So hopefully those two things help. And ski down now and I'll answer some more questions in a minute. Okay, the final few questions now. So I had a question here from David Dixon. You may have seen his YouTube channel as well. He's a, um, somebody that's done something similar to me and, and taken up photography full time. So he asked, if I hadn't been in my car accident in Yosemite, um, would I still taken up full time photography? And I think that was definitely a, a big part of the decision making factor. But more than that was my back. Um, I really struggled with sitting down um, and to, to carry on sitting behind an office desk for me just wasn't a good idea but I suppose the the sort of you know my heart stopping rolling my car in Yosemite having a pacemaker fitted made a really big difference to my sort of outlook on life a little bit and made me realize I've got to sort of seize the day and, and, and make the most of the opportunities and this was an opportunity that came along that I seized and, and it's gone really really well so I think maybe not. Maybe I wouldn't have done it, but who knows? You just you just don't know what fate deals you really. So so it, it's difficult to, to 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 know for sure. Okay, another question that somebody asked around composition was, what's the most important thing in composition? And I'm going to be doing a video on composition in the next few months. But I think something that I'd say is more important than anything else is is to take your time. And it's something that's really noticeable when I run the workshops that that people are quite often surprised that we don't take as many shots and we take more time over fewer shots. Yeah, so I think my top tip would be to, to, to allow you to do that, just go out with one fixed focal length and that then restricts the number of shots that you can take because then you're thinking, okay, I can't zoom in on those far distant mountains or I can't do any macro photography. So you, that restricts you a little bit. And then just take your time, look around and restrict yourself to taking fewer shots. And you'll find that you improve the composition by doing that because you seek out a good composition before you actually commit to it rather than just going and taking a whole host of images. Okay, thanks ever so much for watching. Until next Sunday, bye. Use Photoshop because you only need to use it for thingy my bob. <laughs> my hand is so cold. Okay. How I make a living out of photography. Helicopter. <laughs>